this morning is a special day because we start a new series, but it's a special day as well for Angela, whose birthday is today. And she's making this sign like this to me, which I think, which I think means, Brian, yes, go, go, go. So we just want to say thank you so much. We appreciate you playing the keyboards for us, and um, we appreciate you, and I hope that this will be a great year for you. Now, I've already embarrassed her, but, um, but let me get on with a new series. The book of Job. How many of you have read the book of Job? Oh, I see a lot of hands go up. It, it's my request that as we enter this series that you reread the book of Job. And if you can, read it in at least two different translations so that you get a sense of what's going on with the book of Job. It's been said to be one of the greatest literary works of all time. Can you believe that? The poet Lord Tennyson said if he had to be on an island with only one piece of literature, he would choose the book of Job. John Calvin, the great theologian, lived about 500 years ago, preached 159 sermons on the book of Job. In six months, he did it every day. Every day had a new sermon. Well, I wish I could learn from him. (laughs) But um, I'm not going to do that. We're not going to go for six months, but we'll go for uh, till the end of July is when we'll end with the book of Job. Um, It is a challenging book. But I think it is a book that will speak to us in many ways. God knows our hearts. God knows our thoughts. He knows what we go through. And I think that God is going to speak to you through the book of Job, maybe in a way that will be different than he speaks to me. I think each one of us as we sit here may have different things that we will be learning. But I know for one thing for sure, I know that God's spirit works through his word. And so I think that as we go through this book, God is going to open up some things for us that will be priceless. Why do bad things happen to good people? Have you ever heard that question? I mean, that's a conundrum, right? We know bad things are supposed to happen to bad people, and good people should have good things happen to them. So why do you have good people suffer through bad things? Evil should be punished. Goodness should be rewarded. This is how things are supposed to go. But that is not always our experience. In fact, it so often goes differently that it poses a problem for the Christian believer. If God truly is in control of everything, as we have been taught, then why are things not unfolding in the way that we expect them to? The key word is expect. How we expect them to. Because we think we know what is right and wrong. We think we know what is the way that God should do things in this world, and we think that we know what will be best for us and for the people around us. That's not always true, by the way. I don't want to burst your bubble, but that is not always true. We don't always know what is best. We don't always know what is right. We don't always know what is good. Yes, of course, we try to do that. We do our best but we don't always know. And that's something I think we should always keep in mind. The writing of Job is part of the wisdom writings in the Bible. Eugene Peterson says there's a distinctive strain of writing in the Bible that more or less specializes in dealing with human experience as is. This is what is involved in being human. And don't you forget it. Wisdom is the common designation given to this aspect of biblical witness and writing. 
The word in this context refers more to a kind of attitude, a distinctive stance, than to any particular ideas or doctrines or counsel. As such, wisdom is wide-ranging, collecting under its umbrella diverse and unlikely fellow travelers. What keeps the feet of these fellow travelers on common ground is wisdom's unrelenting insistence that nothing in human experience can be omitted or slighted if we decide to take God seriously and respond to Him believingly. Everything that happens in your life is important to God. And everything that happens in your life is part of the framework of our faith experience. The experience of living in this world created by God and ruled by God from above. God and God's ways, he says, provide the comprehensive plot and sovereign action in the Holy Scriptures. But human beings, every last man and woman of us, including every last detail involved in our daily living, are invited and honored participants in all of it. There are no spectator seats provided for the drama of salvation. Everyone is a player. As we look at this wisdom book then, I want us to keep three things in mind. The first thing is, do not expect to learn the secret as to why people suffer, especially why good people suffer. Because undeserved suffering is something that really gets us worked up. We all, as children, I think, were disciplined by our parents. Now, I know I'm dating myself, but I come from a generation where we still got caned. We still were spanked at home and at school. And we knew that if we had done wrong, there will be a punishment. And we accepted that. Maybe we didn't like it, but we understood it and we accepted it. But when someone is punished undeservingly, when someone suffers undeservingly, that gets us really worked up. The injustice calls forth to us. And we rise up. Our blood pressure rises and we start thinking about how wrong this is that this is happening. I need to turn this thing on. And um, then I'll have a slide here of Eugene Peterson saying, talking about Job, saying Job suffered. His name is synonymous with suffering. He asked why. He asked why me? And he put his questions to God. He asked his questions persistently, passionately, and eloquently. He refused to take silence for an answer. He refused to take cliches for an answer. He refused to let God off the hook. Now, you should feel some discomfort when you read that. Because this is not just a nice and tidy Sunday school lesson. This is a man who feels that he's being punished undeservedly. That he is suffering for no reason. And he doesn't go quietly. He takes his case to God. And he's asking the question, why and why me? And he's not giving up. So I think when we look at the book of Job, we will find not just a perfect answer for when people suffer, but we will find an example of someone who takes his case to God who is in control of all things and is sovereign over everything and is saying to God, why am I suffering? Why me? And why in this way? But here's the thing. 
Even though Job cries out, and even though he's asking God earnestly and honestly, and I think this is what we can take away from Job, his honesty and his integrity before God. Even though he's doing that, you come to the end of the book of Job, and there is no answer. God never takes him aside and says, Job, now come and sit down. Let me explain to you what's going on. Let me tell you what's, what was going on behind the scenes. You were not aware of this, but this is what's going on. Job, let me, let me enlighten you. God never does that. And that's hard for us as human beings, because we want to know why. Job asks the question of God insistently, persistently, and yet he doesn't receive an answer. Now, for some of you, you say, well, then I don't want to read Job because that doesn't make sense to me. Well, I want to ask you, please do read Job. And I think you will see a lot of sense in what's happening. But there won't be an easy answer as to why people suffer, and especially why the righteous suffer or people suffer undeservedly so. Second thing to keep in mind Do not read this book as a defense of God's justice. I've heard people talk about the book of Job and everything that happens is explained according to God's justice. God is right and just in what he's doing and Job is wrong in what he's doing. People say, you know what, Job, he knew about God, but he never really knew God. Job served God, but in his heart, he was never really close to God. He never had that close relationship with God. So God had to take him through all of this so that Job in the end could be on the right side and be in in the right relationship with God. And so everything that happens in his life is kind of explained in a way that makes sure that God is just and right and Job is in the wrong. That's not the right way to read Job. God is the one that calls Job blameless. Blameless. No blame can be, can be laid against him. God is the one who knows his heart. He knows his every thought, his intentions, his hopes, his dreams, his fears. He knows everything about Job and he calls him blameless. Brothers and sisters, this book is not about God's justice. This book is about wisdom. That's why it's part of the wisdom literature in the Bible. Because it's going to convey wisdom to us. It's not about justice. It's a book of poetry. The layout of the book is... Prose, poetry, and prose. The first two chapters, Job 1 and 2, deals with a prologue set in heaven. And that's given to us in a prose narrative. Just in a story format, telling us what's going on behind the scenes. We know that Job never knows that. But we as the reader, we are brought in by the narrator. We are being told these things. Then... Job chapter 3 to Job chapter 42, we have the speeches taking place here on earth. We have Job speaking, we have his friends speaking, eventually we have God speaking to Job. All of those, chapters 3 to 42, is poetry, Hebrew poetry, parallel lines, the same as Psalms, same as Proverbs. These three, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, are the three poetry books of the Bible. And you find them next to each other as well. You go through your Bible, you see Job, you see Psalms, you see Proverbs right there. So it's poetry. And then the last few verses, 7 to 17 in Job 42, we have a prose narrative again, where everything is kind of brought together and we get the epilogue taking place. So there's a short narrative in the beginning, there's a very short narrative at the end, but the body of the book is poetry. 
So we know we're going to be looking for image, images that are being used. We're going to look for the Hebrew poetry style that's being used throughout this book. This is why then that some people believe that Job is not a real person. That he is like the prodigal son who was a figure in the parables of Jesus. A person that is used in this poetry and a person that we can learn from, but not a real flesh and blood person. So there are two camps on this, of course. There are those people who believe that, yes, he is a real person. He was a real person. They point to the fact that the beginning and the end, there's prose. They point to the fact that Job has a name. In many of the uh, parables of Jesus, people don't have names, the figures in the parables. But Job has a name. Job comes from the land of Uz, from a specific place. And Job is referred to in the New Testament by James, the brother of Jesus. So, reasons why is it, well, he was, of course, a real person. Then there are other people who say, no, he wasn't real. This is poetry. The narrative is just the beginning and just the end, but the, the bulk of this book, the whole of this book is poetry. Job doesn't really have a historical and a geographical setting. No one can really place him at any time and place. Job is called blameless. We know that no one really is blameless. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one that's blameless, but he's called blameless. God doesn't really do side bets with Satan about the lives of his people. That's not a real thing. That's like part of the construct of the book of Job. And God is not so callous as to kill ten of Job's children and then to think it's fine because they are replaced by ten again at the end of the book. Well, if it's real or not, it really makes no difference to the wisdom in this book. The parable of the prodigal son is not real. You can't go to Israel and find that prodigal son and meet him and find the farm that we were talking about. But the truth, the wisdom that comes through that parable of the prodigal son is just as real as anything else in the scriptures. We know that that parable is set up to teach us about God's, the Father's love, God the Father's grace, God the Father's mercy. And it does that without the prodigal son having a name in a specific farm that he comes from. The third thing to keep in mind. The first thing is, do not expect to learn the secret as to why people suffer. The second thing was, do not read this book as a defense of God's justice. And the third thing is, do not think that you will understand God better by reading this book. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. God never explains everything to Job. So God never discloses all he's thinking. In fact, you read the whole book and you don't even know what God is really thinking throughout. God speaks in different places. You can hear what he's saying, but he never discloses his thoughts. He never discloses his purposes, why he's doing this, and what he's trying to accomplish through this. In the end, Job makes peace with not understanding God. In the end, Job gives up. He says, I don't understand God. At first I thought I did, then I thought I didn't, and then I thought I did again, and then I, in the end he gives up. John Calvin as I said, who has preached all these sermons on Job, says, And when man has debated the matter thoroughly to and fro, he must needs come to the said conclusion, namely that we comprehend not the greatness and height of God's doings, further than it pleases him to give us some taste of them, 
at least wise according to our capacity, which is over small. I don't know if you like that word, over small. It, it gets highlighted when you put that on your computer because it's not a modern word. But it's a word that many people don't like because they don't want to think of themselves as over small. But to think of ourselves as over small compared to God, I think is the right way to think of ourselves. And this is what Calvin is getting at. God can give us a taste He can give us a a sample or an inkling or something about himself that we can understand, but we can't understand the whole of God. We are just too small. You see, here's the thing. God is too big, too complex, too wonderful for us to understand. Sometimes I think a little illustration, sort of taking it a level down, is helpful. Now, of course, if someone goes to university and they study mathematics and calculus and algebra and all that, they really start to understand a lot about mathematics. But all that knowledge that you get at university is something that a kid in grade one could just never understand. You can be the greatest teacher out, and you can be the smartest grade one kid out, but you're not going to help that kid understand calculus and algebra. They just don't have the capacity to do that. And that's how it is with us and God, I think, is we just don't have the capacity to understand everything about God. We are so thankful for that which God does reveal to us, We are so thankful for the truths He he reveals to us and for the ways in which He brings us into sometimes His thinking and His plans and His purposes. But we will always see dimly. We will always see partially. Because the fact of the matter is that we are just too small. And we just don't have the capacity to know all that. Well, the thing about the book of Job is that we find quite a few dilemmas going on in this book. Job has a dilemma. Job's dilemma, he's saying, why am I being punished? I have done nothing wrong. I am innocent. That's his, his problem with God. He says, God, you are punishing me, and this is not right because I've done nothing wrong. But his dilemma is not just with what, what God is doing to him. His dilemma is also with his friends because they don't believe him. As much as he proclaims his innocence, his friends want nothing <laughs> about that. His friends are, are insisting that, yes, Job, you must have done something wrong. So that's his dilemma. He finds himself in a situation suffering, and he feels he's innocent and shouldn't happen. The friends have a dilemma. Their dilemma is the question, they say, why does Job not give in and admit that he's in the wrong? Job must be in the wrong, because God can't be in the wrong. Something is happening between God and Job, and we know that God is perfect, so it must be Job's fault. There's no other option. And the friends are trying to get this across to Job, and Job doesn't want to accept that. That's the impasse. That's the dilemma. That's the struggle that they have. How can we get Job to admit that he's done wrong. The only way forward for him is to come clean and to ask for God's forgiveness. Job has a dilemma. His friends have a dilemma. God has a dilemma. 
God's policies of running the world is being questioned. You see, this book is more about God than it is about Job. And God's policies are being questioned. The accusation is that Job only serves God because he blesses him. Satan says, does Job serve God for nothing? He says, of course Job is going to serve you, God, because you've put a hedge of protection around him. You've been blessing everything he does. And by the way, God, this is not a good way to run the world. We have a dilemma as we read this book, because how do you square an all-good, all-powerful God with unjust suffering? Are the critics right? Is God not good enough to prevent unjust suffering? Like He just doesn't care? Or is God not powerful enough to prevent unjust suffering? He does care, but he can't do anything about it. Now, we can at least keep up the appearance of justice if Job accepts his guilt and his consequent suffering. But our dilemma is that Job doesn't. He doesn't go quietly. He's protesting his innocence. And he's insisting that he's done nothing wrong. And yet, he is suffering, experiencing punishment from God. And then, of course, Satan has a dilemma. Because despite all his best efforts, he can't get Job to turn around and to curse God. So he also has a dilemma. If we keep these three things in mind, I think it will help us as we work our way through the book of Job. Submission to God and to His ways, I think, is the best course of wisdom. Wisdom is seen as understanding. Many ask the question, why? He said, if I can understand something, I can accept it. But wisdom is not just understanding. Wisdom in many instances is also the course of action. It's not seeing the whole picture and understanding what's going on, but it's in the limited understanding that you have, choosing the right action. And I think this is what Job is doing in this book. He does not understand the whole picture. He does not understand why he's suffering, even though he's innocent. He doesn't understand why God is allowing this. But yet, at the same time, the action that he chooses is wise. And his wisdom grows through the book. He's not at the same place when the book starts as when the book ends. His wisdom has grown. Not his wisdom in understanding everything, but his wisdom in making the right decisions and taking the right action. And I think this is what we will learn from this book. You know, I've met people who have no fear of the Lord. People who believe they know what is just and right, and they feel that God is not acting like He should. They say they look forward to Judgment Day. They will put God on the spot and they will ask Him questions. No fear of God. No wisdom. Utterly foolish. John Calvin said this. He says, The better to profit ourselves by that which is contained in this present book, first and foremost, it behoves us to understand the sum of it. For the story here written shows us how we be in God's hand and that it lies in Him to determine of our life and to dispose of the same accord to His good pleasure and that it is our duty to submit ourselves to Him with all humbleness and obedience. 
That is the wisdom that we can learn from the book of Job. I want to end with a psalm, a few verses from Psalm 111. It says, The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. We should never forget this, brothers and sisters, that God is faithful and just, and everything He does is trustworthy, even if we don't understand it. He provided redemption for His people. He ordained His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow His precepts have good understanding. And to Him belongs eternal praise. I think this is what we can learn. If we accept and know that our God is faithful and just and trustworthy, if we can know that no matter what happens in our lives, and we make our decisions and we plot our course on that basis, I think we will be wise people. And I think Job would have taught us something. Let us pray. Father God, I pray that as we go into this series and we learn more about your dealings in the book of Job, I pray, Lord, that we would grow in our wisdom. I pray that we would not be afraid to ask questions like Job did. I pray that we would know that you are big enough and loving enough and kind enough to accept all the questions we have. But I also pray, Lord, that that we would grow in wisdom in knowing that whatever you do is good and just and true and trustworthy. And we can know that no matter what happens in our lives. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to plot our course accordingly and to make our choices and do what we do on that basis. Would you bless us, Lord? Would you teach us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing your great?